Well, good morning, everybody. So good to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Daniel. I serve on team here and on behalf of the whole team that makes this weekend what it is. A very warm welcome. You're joining us in the penultimate weekend, the last one before last in our series, The Good Life. So if you've been with us throughout the summer, you'll know that we've been covering Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, the kingdom life where Jesus stands there on the hillside and addresses the crowds and really speaks to them in this revelatory way and says, live this way, you've heard live that way, don't live that way, live this way. And we've gone through this series and uh, I really hope and pray that it's really been meeting you where you're at and really stirring you to lean into what it is that God wants for your life. I want to begin today with a news story. The headline reads, Texas bar owner sues church. Uh, really, to read this story to set the stage for our message this weekend. So here we go. In the small East Texas town of Mount Vernon, Drummond's Bar began construction on a new building to increase their business. Upon hearing the news, the local Baptist church started a campaign to block the bar from opening through petitions and prayers. Pray as they did, the work of the bar progressed right up until the week before opening when lightning came forth from the stormy heavens, struck the bar and burned it to the ground. True story, Snopes.com. After hearing of the effects of the inclement weather, the church folks were rather smug in their outlook and their newfound intercessory prowess, that was until the bar owner sued the church on the grounds that the church was either ultimately responsible for the demise of the new building, either through direct means or indirect actions or means. After hearing of this intense accusation, the church vehemently denied all responsibility or any connection to the building's demise in its reply to the court. As the case, here it is, the best part, as the case made its way into court, the judge looked over the paperwork at hearing, he commented, quote, I really don't know how I'm going to decide this case. It appears that we have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and an entire church congregation who does not. (laughs) There it is. Good stuff. Good stuff. Love that. Hey, if you have your Bibles, Matthew 7, chapter 7. Today we're talking about the power of prayer that we actually do believe in. We do believe in. So let me open this up in prayer and join with the good old Texan Baptist. Let's pray. Father, we honour you. We love you. We bless you. We celebrate your presence in our lives. And we say, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and speak through the inerrancy of the Word of God. Speak through these words that I'll share. And God, would you stir us and challenge us today to live kingdom-minded lives, uh, an expansive view of what it is that you want to do in and through our lives in the world. Not just that we'll just get through the week, but God, we're going to be an overcomer because of the work of your Spirit in our lives. We believe that for our children and our children's children. We believe that for us, God. We believe that for our colleagues. We, we lean into you, God what it is that you want to do through the power of prayer and the criticality of praying and seeking your face. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. From the earliest moments of creation, we learn that God, our God, is a communicative God. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 speak about in the beginning, there was darkness, but the Spirit of God hovered over the creation, the cosmos. It hovered. But verse 3, and God spoke. God said. One of the very first things that we learn about the character of our God is that He is a communicative God. So much so the psalmist writes this in Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Verse 9, for He spoke and it came to be. God's voice has boomed throughout all of creation, not as an isolated monologue, but as an intimate conversation. Inviting us, we see with Adam and Eve, speaking, walking with them, talking to them. And we see throughout the Old Testament, the patriarchs and the prophets and even the poetry of the Old Testament that God speaks. And it's not this oblique, this distance, but rather it's this intimate and direct voice that God wants to speak into our lives. Millennia on, what do we call this word of God, this voice of God? We call it prayer, prayer. And when you get into the New Testament, you see that Jesus even says that the epicenter, the pinnacle, the apex of the local church is to be called a house of prayer. He writes there in Matthew 21, verse 13, in quoting Isaiah 56, Jesus says, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, or as it says in Isaiah 56, for all people. Prayer is the means in which we commune with God. Prayer is the means of which we express our needs. Prayer is the means by which we can express that which we need, that which we desire. Prayer is the way in which we speak and receive 
from God. We speak to and we receive from God. But yet, I confess, it is tempting for me all too often to relegate or demote the value of prayer in my life. It's easy for me to go, if God is so sovereign as He is, and He is a sovereign entity, if He is aware of all things and He is omnipresent, why does He need me to jog His memory of certain things that He wants to do in my life? Well, one author writes it this way in terms of why do we pray, saying this, God knows what we need. He just likes the sound of our voices. Okay, before you comment, that is a cute phrase and all, it's sweet and it's memorable, but I believe there is a whole lot more to prayer than the fact that He just likes the sound of your voice or he likes the sound of my voice. He even winds up my wife in that regard, if that's true. But anyway, I love what Blaise Pascal, a famous Christian philosopher, says it this way, God, through prayer, has granted us, now track with me some really gritty words, the dignity of causation. The dignity of causation. God has granted to us, through prayer, the dignity of causation, meaning that our words, we have the respective relationship, but we also have the invitation into involvement. We're involved in what happens in this world. The dignity of causation that when we speak in such a way, we see the hand of God move. St. Augustine, who died before Blaise Pascal opened his breath for the very first time, says it this way, without God, we cannot. But without us, God will not. I don't know how you feel about that quote, but I'll tell you, it's probably one of my favourite quotes in all of Christendom. Let me read to you again. Without God, we cannot absolutely build a theology right there. Without God, we cannot. Yet without us, God will not. Now, let me explain that. God has this mysterious co-regent relationship with creation, that though God can do all things, He chooses to work through us. People often say, well, God doesn't need me. And while that is true theologically, experientially, that's untrue. God does need you. God wants you. God desires to work through you. Think of it as a garden. Think of it as creation. God has given you a garden. And yet if you leave it unattended, all of a sudden you have weeds that eclipse your plants. You have trees that are dying. You have grass that's gone and died. Why? You are demonstrating a dominion in that realm to though God has given you through creation the garden, He then wants to partner with you in the way you tend to the garden. God can do all things, but chooses through the dignity of causation to work and engage you in this world. So why are you living a missional life? If God could save people, why live a missional life? Because though God has the capacity to save people, He wants your words to be the vehicle in some way and the means of which that person comes to hear of the gospel. The dignity of causation. Glory to God, right? That even our tepid, meek, oftentimes quiet words of prayer move the hand of God. The classical prayer position of a radical Asian believer is on their knees crying out to God. The position of prayer for the typical American evangelical is laying in their bed with their head on their pillow. God, thank you so much. I just pray. That is the typical position of prayer for the American evangelical. So much so, my wife and I embody that comment. So much so, we'll lay in bed at night. She's like, honey, before we go to bed, before we fall asleep, can you pray for me? And I'm like, sure. And she goes out loud. And I'm like, I'm praying. (laughs) I'm praying. It's just so deep, you can't hear the utterances to the Lord. Only the Spirit can hear them. She's like, yeah, I'm not the Spirit. I'd like to hear what it is. You're praying about me. And I'm like, Suspicious much? Anyway, (laughs) here is the thought. We ought to pray out loud. We ought to express our needs to the Lord. And so much so with all of that as an introduction to our message this weekend, verse 7, chapter 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And to the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. When I read that passage with a simple faith, it just takes my breath away. Six different ways, six different times, Jesus asks us to pray. He almost begs us to pray. Ask of me, seek me, knock. And it has this imagery of growing intensity. Ask casually, seek intently, knock, beat down the door. And though it's beautiful, and though it's actually really inviting, ask and seek and knock, 
Therein lies a tension with that passage, and herein lies the tension. More often than not, I ask and I don't receive. I seek and I cannot find. I knock and the door doesn't open to me. In fact, at times, it feels like the door is firmly slammed in my face. We're going to come back to this concept of unanswered prayer here later in the message. But I want you to pause and hold it there as it relates to I pray. I've been asking, seeking, and knocking, and things are not opening up for me. We're going to come back to that. Part of our battle, though, in prayer comes about because of the emphasis in our English cultural perspective of where we emphasize the word in the verse 7. I'm going to read it to you with an intentional emphasis. Let me read it to you again, verse 7 only. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. We place an emphasis in verse 7 on the certainty of the result, not in the invitation into relationship. We place it upon the certainty of we are going to get this. Assuredly so, it will be given when we ask. It's almost this guarantee. Almost as if God is some sort of celestial cosmic um, piñata, And if you hit him hard enough, often enough, good things finally eventually fall into your lap and you unwrap them and they're full of sugar and they're really good. The truth is, God is not a cosmic piñata. And while at times, sometimes we go, man, I sure wish you were, deep down, I actually don't think we want him to be. We want God to be sovereign. We want him to be this holy entity that does through sovereignty what he chooses in our lives. But it's human nature because we want to receive. But yet in the original language, to really lean into first century context just for a moment, when Jesus would have said these words, he wouldn't have, and you can find this hidden in the original language, he wouldn't have placed the emphasis on the certainty of the result. He would have placed it by saying this. And to understand where Jesus places the weight in this passage, you have to invert it. Where here we read it and say, ask and it will be given, Jesus actually changed it and says this, to, be, to have the chance of receiving, you've got to be asking. To stand a hope of finding, you've got to be seeking. And for a door to be opened in your life, you better be knocking. And he changes it. And the emphasis in the original language where Jesus would have just casually spoken these words, he's like, you guys, you want to find something? You better be looking. You want to have that door open in your life? You better be standing there knocking because the door isn't just going to casually open. You want to find something that's been lost? You've got to seek in places where no one else is seeking. And the emphasis of this whole passage is there as it relates to the way Jesus emphasizes in the original language, the onus upon us for relationship. So much so it leads us to a point here and then it's talking about the will of God. There are two wills that I want to speak about. There's the will do of action, And there's the will of God in terms of abiding. The will of action and the will of God. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn me to 1 John 5, 14 and 15. For the next little while, we're going to go a little bit on a a biblical journey of some different references. If you want to follow me, you can. I mean, if you don't want to or you cannot because of speed, they're in the app. The first one is 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This, he says, is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will. We just read in Matthew 7, will. This is now a different will. This is a capital W, the will of God. The will of God. He hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Our request, our prayer is predicated upon the will of God. So much so, even Jesus realized this. Jesus even said it's the will of the Father in a moment of absolute desperation, in a moment of absolute guttural plea of God to move in his life. Matthew says this in chapter 26. Jesus, he speaks and he says, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So what is the will of God? Entire libraries across our country are filled with people writing their perspective on what is the will of God. 
Many times growing up, I was a youth pastor. When Moses walked the earth, I was a youth pastor here at Mountain Springs. And there'd be many times where a young person would come up to me and they're like, what is the will of God? I just want to know the will of God. And I'm so caught up in fixating over what is the will of God that I, I don't know what to do in life. Now, let me tell you, that's the wrong em- emphasis. Some people are like, God, which parking spot do you want me to be in? Is it this one or four to the right, that one? Which in your sovereign providence is the one that you opened up for me today? God's like, I, I don't care. Just pick one, get into Walmart and I'll see you when you come out. Like, but we get so fixated on what is the perfect will of God. Somebody once said this to me, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and do whatever you want. Now take that in careful tension. But yet the emphasis is, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart because then you'll be abiding and then do whatever you want because your wants will be His will. But live in such a way to where there's liberty and freedom. But what is the will of God? Well, Paul says, it's not that complicated. First Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18, he says this, this is the will of God for you. So if you don't know the will of God for your life, this week, I'm about to give it to you. And it's really memorable. It's really simple. It's just almost impossible to do, but here it is. Verse 16, rejoice always, check. Pray without ceasing, check. Verse 18, and give thanks in all circumstances, check. Okay, I went 0 and 3 on that for the will of God this week. But here's the point. The will of God is, to a certain degree, simple and clear, but yet really hard to gain. So herein lies where abiding comes in. John 15, John 15, I'm going to explain all this and I'm going to get to three points of application in our message this weekend. We started with a Baptist story and we're going to end with a Baptist three-point message. Here we go. John 15, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. Okay, herein lies a pivot in the passage. Earlier, ask in alignment to the will of God, but now here in John's gospel, it says, if you abide and my words abide, Ask whatever it is that you wish. That kind of underscores what I said a moment ago. Love the Lord your God with everything and then do whatever you want. If your words abide in me, Jesus, the wishes of my life are going to align with your will for my life. And therein lies the, 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 the emphasis of prayer. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. How do you prove that you're a Jesus follower? It's not quoting scripture on some sort of social media outlet. It's not getting into an argument with a fool. Don't wrestle with a pig in public. They enjoy it. You get muddy. Here's the point. Here's the point. You prove to be a disciple when you bear fruit. How do you bear fruit? By abiding in the Father, Abiding in the words of Jesus and then doing, he says, to a certain degree, how it intention with quotes, whatever you wish. Therein lies this great invitation. Yes, it's complex, but at the same time, it's simple. Love the Lord your God with everything. And don't become so preoccupied with God. Is it this or is it that? Embrace the, the beauty of the scripture that he speaks to you as to what is the obedient kingdom life. So all of that being said is a benchmark of prayer, three points. Some of you came here today for the three points. You're like, forget all the intro stuff. He is so verbose with the intro. Give me the points. Number one, we must ask God for our provisions to be met. And if you know me well, you'll know that I'm cursed with the spirit of alliteration. So you can predict most of these will be alliterated. Number one, we must ask God for our provisions to be met. Philippians 4, 6 says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. 70 times in the New Testament, we are told to ask of God. We're told to implore God to move on our behalf. We're called to invite Him to be present in a powerful way through provision in our lives. We're to ask of God. Now, I want to encourage you, pray bold and expectant prayers. God doesn't get frustrated when you ask for more. Frankly, you can see in Scripture, sometimes He's concerned when we're willing to settle for less. He wants to give you more than you can ask, seek, or imagine. So ask, seek, and imagine what it is that God wants to do in your life. So we pray for the provision to be met. Number two, we must seek God for His presence to be manifest. There is this incredible emphasis throughout all of Scripture about seeking the presence of God. Jeremiah 29 says this, Call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. Verse 13, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Verse 14, And I will be found by you. 
we have got to nurture this aggressive pursuit of God and remove as we can every stain of passive indifference that invades our lives. If you have walked with God for more than 20 years, you are at risk of becoming complacent and apathetic in your faith life to where there is this passive indifference that enters your life. But if you're not dead, you're not done. And pray bold and expectant prayers. Seek the heart and the faith and the presence of God. The presence of God is the omnipresence of God, meaning He is at all places and all times. Also, the manifest presence of God. Now, let me explain omni and manifest. Omnipresence is like an Amazon delivery driver. They're just everywhere. Uh, Everywhere you go, you see an Amazon delivery driver. But omnipresence is you seeing them in the neighbourhood Manifest presence is that moment where the angels cry out and the seraphim and the cherubim rejoice because your package is being delivered. (laughs) That is the manifest presence of God. We need to pray for the Amazon delivery driver and the Holy Spirit to come to our house. Now, don't be offended because it will get much worse. Okay, here's the point. (laughs) Omnipresence, you see it. Omnipresence, you sense it. Omnipresence, you're aware that God is at work. Absolutely. Theology 101, God is always at work. Theology 201 is join Him where He is at work. 301 is He begins to work through your life in such a way as to where others observe the presence of God flowing through your life. Pray for the manifest presence of God in your life. Don't just pray for provision. In fact, Jesus even says, seek first the kingdom and all of those things that you pray for are gonna be added. There is this sense of progression. We seek the kingdom of God. We ask for the provision of God. And point number three, point number three, we must pursue God for His promises to be fulfilled. For His promises to be fulfilled. 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all of the promises of God find their yes in Him. This is why, or forgive me, that is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God or our amen to God for His glory. Amen to God. Amen is not just a church phrase, a platitude, a crutch. Amen means, yeah, so let it be. Amen. God, let it be so in my life. I agree with their prayer. Amen. I'm agreeing that God were asking you to do that in their life. The whole book of Joshua is about possessing the promises of God. The promise of God was offered But there is the offering of the promise and there is the procurement of the promise. The procurement of the promises of God are predicated entirely upon us abiding and us asking. The promises of God. What are the promises of God in your life? Lori and I, since we got married back in the mid-90s, have prayed that we would see not only our children walk with God, but their children, and we would see this multi-generational impact of our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids growing in the things of the Holy Spirit. We believe God gave us that as a promise, and we're praying into it every day. We're praying in God, would you grant that promise? Pray in the promises of God in your life. That is, this is not me saying, name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. This is me simply saying, God has spoken it and He wants you to get it. So pray into it. There's a tension there. It's not how big is my faith to get what I think God wants to give me. It is how small is my faith in the bigness of God that He wants to grant me. And therein lies a very big difference theologically. God is enormous and wants to give. We are small. And even if our faith is the size of a mustard seed, it doesn't matter the size of the seed. It matters the size of the field and the one that owns it all. So pray. Pray for provision. Pray for presence. And pray for the promises of God, which leads me into the flip side of the reality of prayer. And that is this, the struggle of when we knock and seek and ask and things don't break loose. Arguably, there is nothing harder in the Christian life than praying and not seeing an answer. And in fact, praying for someone else to receive and they receive and praying for yourself and it's like, hello, dial tone. Doo. If you're under 21, you don't know what a dial tone is. But <laughs> if you're over 21, you do, you go, oh, okay. Remember those phones that you had to put your finger in and like rotate it? Mom's like, honey, do you want to call your friend? I'm like, nope, it's way too much work. I'm like, needing. <laughs> Here's the thing. There is nothing harder than when you pray and you don't see an answer. Tim Keller writes about this struggle. 
And he writes this, he says this, when a child of mine, speaking from God's perspective in his great book, Walking Through Pain and Suffering, when a child of mine, this is God speaking, makes a request, I always give to them what he or she would have asked for if they knew everything I know. Friends, we live in the now and the not yet of the kingdom. We live in the now where we are redeemed. We live in the not yet of the restoration that is to come. The scenes of creation, created, fallen, redeemed, restored. The restored is the new heavens, the new earth created is the heavens and the earth. We live in this tension of this reality of we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. And we have moments and glimpses where it seems as if God pulls back the curtain of the supernatural, the curtain of the fourth dimension where the power that was present at creation is revealed in our lives. And we pull it back and we see a miracle. But there are times when we try to pull back the curtain and we can't pull back the curtain. Only God can pull back the curtain. And prayer is always the invitation of relationship but not the certainty of a result. Because prayer is only ever best one part faith, three parts grace. The grace of God. And so much so, even the verse that is in the passage, that how much more though does the heavenly Father want to give good gifts to those that ask? Or in Luke's translation, give the Holy Spirit. Spirit. I want to say this phrase to those of you that <clears throat> are praying and you haven't seen a result. There are things in my life I'm praying, I've kept praying, and I'm not seeing the result. And rather than say, oh, you'll be fine, like just get over it, or slap a verse on it, or just have more faith, like I'm not going to belittle your pain or even belittle my own and say, God, you've yet to do that. What I am going to say though is keep praying, keep abiding, keep trusting. And keep waiting in hope. The Apostle Paul writes this to the Roman church, and we'll be studying the book of Romans here in about six to eight weeks from now. We're going to go through about a 20 part exegetical study of the book of Romans. Romans 8 says this If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Is that hard? You better believe it's hard. As Scott McKnight says, sometimes hope lags behind my petitions and sometimes hope sustains me in my petitions. But I keep praying because I believe that God is good. Hillsong wrote a song some years ago called Seasons. And the lyric that really caught my attention this past week is this lyric that says, you could have saved us in a second, but instead you sent a child. God could save you in an instant, but instead he sent a child. So and such are the seasons of prayer. But remain faithful, for God is faithful. And even when we are faithless, he is faithful. Trust in the faithfulness of God. Trust in the faithfulness of God in your life. Pray, pray without ceasing. Put words to your desires. Think the Holy Spirit is doing something in this room right now. And I want to close with the words of Fred Beckner. And then we're going to sing a reprise of the song Miracles. It says this, go where your best prayers take you. Mount Springs, unclench the fists of your spirit and take it easy. Breathe deep of the glad air and live one day at a time and know that you are precious. Will you stand with me? Father, we pray for miracles. We pray, Father, for you to move. Come, Holy Spirit, in our lives. We believe you are good and we trust in your goodness. In your name we pray. I loved what Daniel had for us today. What great reminders for us to ask in prayer, to seek him and to knock. Even when we don't understand what God has for us, we can keep asking. If you need prayer from us, we are here for you. We love you. We want to pray with you. We hope to see you here next time.